And but uh, call the meeting to order. <laughs> call the meeting to order, and uh, we'll flag a uh, stand up to do the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and in this world, for liberty and justice for all. Um, we had a closed session meeting. There was no, uh, uh, no, no action taken. So going from there, we'll go with protocol. We have, I think before we do the protocol, I think we'll go ahead and start with our band students tonight. We have Marengo Ranch band students and music teacher, Mary Pizzicara. Please come on up. Thank you for coming tonight. We're excited to hear you guys play. That was great. Thank you. Wonderful job. Thank you. We're all going to go home and get our Christmas lights up yeah. next. <laughs> Got us in the holiday spirit. Thank you, Mrs. Pescara. And thank you, parents, for coming on out and bringing your students tonight. You guys did a great job. We'll make sure that the big drum gets back to Marengo tomorrow. <laughs> Hey, Levi. 
You going for a three peat? <laughs> Spelling bee. Spelling bee, yeah. It's coming up. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So I will go ahead and review our board meeting protocol before we get our meeting started tonight. Our session is being recorded. It's open to the public and being broadcast live through Zoom. For public comments, there are three minutes per agenda item, and the board shall limit the total time for public comment for each item to 20 minutes. Please note that the board offers the public the ability to comment during the meeting during via Zoom and provide comments in person at the meeting location. If the board experiences technical difficulties with Zoom or the use of Zoom results in disruption of the meeting, the board may decline to limit I de decline to limit or not allow further comment via Zoom for the remainder of the meeting. With board consent, the board president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comment. To make a public comment via Zoom, notify the board meeting assistant through the chat box feature or by using the raised hand feature in Zoom during the agenda item to be addressed and you will be identified by your display name. To make public comment in person, there are public um, forms over at the, the doors there, and please give that to Ms. Bach, our meet board meeting assistant. Email public comments can be emailed to the superintendent email 24 hours before the board meeting. They would be posted to our website with the agenda. Um, public comment is limited to 450 words, and we did not receive any email public comments for our meeting tonight. Board vote and connectivity. Each motion will be followed by a roll call for action items. And should a board member attend the meeting remotely and lose connectivity by teleconference or phone, the meeting would be delayed by five minutes and regular meetings shall be adjourned by 1030. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we're moving on uh, to item F, public comments for topics not on the agenda. Are there any? No, there are no requests for public comment. Thank you. So we'll move on to G reports, LCAP goal number one. We'll start off with acceleration blocks. Thank you. Um, board, you had asked in the past to provide you with some general information on acceleration, acceleration blocks. In your packet, you will find um, a summary of what we have offered. Know that the acceleration blocks, of course, takes place after school. It's an eight um, session cycle that students participate in, one hour each day. So in that report, you will find the number of rotations or cycles that we've had per grade level. You don't have this information by school. We thought it was more important to provide you this information by grade level. You also have the number of students that participated out of those cycles. It could be the, some of the same children, um, but that is the total number of students. And then we also added the focus area. You probably have noticed that the strongest focus area appears to be in multiplication fluency. We did have a total of 38, bless you, 38 rotations uh, involving 276 students. At the bottom, there are four quotes uh, that we've had um, that were shared with us from a teacher, an administrator, and a student. I would like to read to you the one, the second one, which came from a student. On the first day of school, a fourth grade student shared with her teacher, you will know me as the student who doesn't know math. After the acceleration block, that same student went up to her teacher and said, I love math. So the, the whole intent of the acceleration blocks is to provide targeted instruction in very specific areas. Um, to ideally, you know, make a difference in how the children are doing in class. So at a later time, we will bring to you another report regarding acceleration blocks and the impact on achievement. 
At this point, this is more like a baseline. We don't have a second set of data points to share with you how effective these uh, acceleration blocks are, but we thought this provided you at least with a general idea of what we're doing and, and how many and in what area. Do you have any questions or any comments? The states here, the strongest focus area was multiplication fluency. So is that what we're really focused on their math? Yes. In this? And I think that has to do with, with most of the data that we look at, that we have been looking at for years, continues to show that math is an area that we need to strengthen. So I'm assuming, obviously, teachers see that on the formative assessments that they give, and they have identified math as the area to target. I just want to say thank you. I think I might have been one of the people that asked for this, so um, I appreciate it very much. So thank you. Very helpful. Yes. Admin, any thoughts on acceleration blocks? I think another key point of this is not just the content, but the engagement part of giving kids something positive or something to look forward to, something that they can grow in their confidence. I think that that's then trickling the intent that I think a lot of feedback I'm getting is the tent, intent is that these students are feeling more front-loaded or confident in the direct instruction in the regular day of their school. So I know that's something teachers are also being mindful about and monitoring. It's not really measurable, but, you know, mm -hmm. attendance, things like that, participation, those are things they're also looking for. Connectedness to school, which is something that every administrator has focused on. Um, I do have a question. So it says number of rotations. So it says kindergarten, four. Then it says number of students, 26. So does that, does that mean there's four different times you met with 26? Or how, 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 what's this mean? It means there were four rotations throughout the district. And some rotations might have had six students. Or another rotation might have had eight students. Another rotation might have had okay. five. We, we try to go for six to eight children, knowing that at times they may not be able to make it. So that's why the numbers don't really completely align. So you had four rotation of those four rotation, 26 students were served. Yes, that's exactly it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Moving on, we'll go to measures of academic progress. Thank you. Kawhi, can you display those? Thank you so much. So in your package, you also have um, map data results. Um, as you recall, we give map to all students in grades first through eighth grade in the fall and the winter. Our LCAP goal is to increase by 5% percent from winter to winter. And the reason we identified winter to winter is because in the spring, third through eighth grade students take SBAC instead of MAP. We could administer both, but really it's, it would be testing for an entire month. And we didn't feel that was a good use of instructional time. So instead of taking MAP a third time, the older students take um, SBAC. So the LCAP goal is that 5% from winter to winter. And because we did identify winter to winter, then that means we can't look at a grade level across. We have to look at student groups. And this is important because each group starts at a different place. So if we measure the growth of a cohort, we're better able to gauge the amount of growth for that same group at a different time. So if you take a look at the data in your packets or the data on displayed on the wall, you we uh, provide it to you winter 2023 as your baseline, current fall scores, and a projected target for the winter 2024. So if you add five to winter 23, that's the target for winter 2024. So I would like to highlight in the area of reading, if you take a look at first grade winter of 23, they were at 30% of 30% uh, of the children reached the 60th percentile on map. 
And if you're asking why the 60th percentile, that appears to be the percentile that can best determine if the children are at grade level, especially when they take SBAC. So if they're scoring around the 60th percentile, they're gonna be okay. So this reflects the percent of students that reach that 60th percentile. Um, again, in first grade, winter of 2023, 20, 30%. Uh, that same group of children now in second grade, 49% of them are at the 60th percentile or above. So obviously you can see they've already met the projected target of 35. Take a look at uh, second grade in 2023 and how they performed as third graders now. Again, they have exceeded the projected target for the winter. The same is true for fifth grade. Uh, take a look at math, again, uh, second and third grade, and then seventh grade in math. Any thoughts on what you're seeing here before we go to each individual school? I just had one area I was struggling with because, like, for example, the 30, it went to 49, which is great, but then it went down to 35. So is the goal to maintain the 49%? Or is it, because we don't want to go down, right? Correct. So it's, we met it, but we want to maintain the 49% or improve that. Is that correct? At a minimum, we want to maintain. Okay, excellent. Okay. That was where I was struggling. Like, <laughs> yes. Go down, are we? Okay. And, and keep in mind also that, again, and, and you hear me say this every time I share data with you, we work with children. We don't work with things. Children are unpredictable. Sometimes in the class, formative assessments show that yeah, Cleo knows exactly what's going on. She can answer it, and then you give Cleo a test and don't know what happened. So when you look at these scores, um, something that I used to say a few years ago, it's this is uh, like a window into the classroom. You're not in the classroom. You can't possibly see everything that affected those scores. It's just a window. You're not even at the door. So through a window, you have a very limited view of what goes inside the classroom but at least it's a view. And it's a, it's a view that we can rely on and we plan with. So if you go to the next page, uh, we have River Oaks, Greer and Lake Canyon. At River Oaks, again, take a look at second and third grade. At Greer, take a look at third and fourth for reading and take a look at second and third again for math. Lake Canyon reading second and third and fifth. And in math second grade, by now you're probably seeing a pattern of that second and third grade. Why do you think that is? Why would those grade levels grow more than the rest, do you think? Because of the COVID policies? Exactly. And, and it's something that we continue to see, right? If, if you kind of count backwards, where were those eighth graders? when we shut down, what grade? Where were those fifth graders when we partially sort of came back? Where were those fourth graders when we came back with masks and the quarantines? Where were we when we kind of came back, but not really? So if, if you really look at that first, second and third grade group, that's the group that really has been with us under more normal circumstances. So, Important to note that teachers are doing their best, admin are doing their best. But yeah, now we're seeing the, the impact of not being in school on a regular basis. It's going to be a, a little bit hard to recover from that, but I do want you to know that teachers are doing their best to look at standards in a different way, to compact, to bundle, to do anything with standards and skills and concepts, to try to accelerate the learning, knowing that yeah, I mean, some of those scores hurt, but everyone is doing everything they can. Um, on the next slide or set of data, we have Marengo Ranch, Valley Oaks, and McCaffrey. At Marengo, again, take a look at second grade in reading, and for math, take a look at second and third. At Valley Oaks, again, second and third, fifth and sixth for reading. Uh, and in math, take a look at second grade. And at McCaffrey, take a look at seventh grade math. So we're seeing progress, we're seeing growth. Um, 
Thank you, Annette, for again asking that important question. The, the goal is never to maintain. That, that's the that's the minimum. The, the goal is to always increase. Um, but again, it's I think the data highlights, and regardless of what data we present to you, whether it's this or DRA next time we meet, it, it kind of keeps showing the same thing that older children are needing a lot more than at times we can offer. Admin, before we close, any thoughts on MAP? They're just like children. Did you notice that no one wants to uh, look at me? There's no eye contact. Mr. Nelson kind of pushed me to say something, so he hit me in, in the leg below the-, the Peer chest. pressure. It is always peer pressure. Um, I think that when we look at the data as a as a whole, we always look that we only have the students for two years at a middle school. So we really look at diving into what the needs are at that point uh, for math, for example, are they using different programs like Math Accelerator? They're doing goals, individual goals for students, and then breaking down those goals for the students to understand what it, actually they're going to try to attain. We know that we moving up from one level is one thing, but we also try to celebrate the students that are showing growth. And that's the most important thing is that they look at, well, I didn't move up a level, but did you show growth? It's it's switching that mentality for our students to not say, okay, I, I didn't make it, I didn't do this, but let's look at what happened. What what can we look to dissect the the information and, and have them and really simplify that information for them. So right now we look at this as a baseline. Our teachers are really working hard. They're really looking at the common assessments. They're trying to see and target provide more intervention between the classrooms. So um, I mean, we look at it as much as we can. We look at the holes that they have and, and from that point, try to design and implement goals for each individual student. Thank you. Any thoughts or questions with that board? Okay, thank you. Yep, going on to number three, the LCAP goal number one, California Smart Balance Assessment, the SBAC. All right, thank you. So a little bit more on assessment data. We have shared with our staff and our parents that the Smarter Balanced Assessments SBAC uh, data is now public. It is on the state website. So these are the tests in Eng English language arts and math that students take every year, every spring in grades three to eight. And so what I would like to highlight is, is how we're doing compared to um, our district compared to the state as well. So we would start first with English language arts. We're looking at the students, the percentage of students meeting or exceeding state standards. So first you look at the state of California, um, there was a dip. So we're comparing 22 to 23, um, and 23 um, in the state, now 46% of students are proficient. It was a dip of a little over 1% statewide. For the LM, for us, for Galt, um, we are at a 47.50. Um, we are higher than the state, a little bit higher than the state, and we did see growth. We saw almost a percentage growth compared to um, last year. So that's good. We're at least we're moving in the right direction. Still have more, still definitely want more growth than that, but at least we are trending in the right direction. And then you have that breakdown um, by school as well. And then if we look at math in um, the state, um, there was improvement. So the state, although it's still low, um, the percentage of students in the state meeting math is only 34.6%, but it did go up a little over 1%. So that's good, trending in the right direction. Um, for our district, we are almost 4% uh, higher than the state. We're at 38.3, and we went up almost 3% in math. And then you have um, the growth there. Almost all of our sites saw some pretty good growth in math. So that, it, again, has been a target area for us. It's an area that we are lower. We definitely want to be higher than 38% proficient in math. But again, we're at least we are trending in the right direction. And then next to report to you will be the dashboard. The dashboard will be public in December. I'm not sure if it will be public yet to take it to the December board meeting. If not, we'll bring it to you in January. But that's the next layer of state accountability for these assessments will be the dashboard. Any questions on that? Really any questions? It's more of a comment. 
that uh, if you look at the scores from the page before, kind of worrisome on the, on some of it. But then when you turn this page and you're like, oh, wow, like compared to the state, we're doing very well. Yeah, we yeah, we're doing we're doing pretty good, especially like that math. Mm -hmm. So it's it's nice to see. Yeah, that it, it's it's very troublesome that in our state that we're that low in math. Anybody else have any questions? No, I just I'm I'm you, I'm a glass, I guess, half full or half empty in this case. It's, I kind of agree with Lois just from a, a overall state perspective. I mean, very alarming, only because so many people might look at this and make decisions about whether to put their children into public school, and that's what is very alarming. I know we're doing our best and we're trying and we're making improvements and we're doing better. But just from a society perspective, this is very alarming to me personally to mm -hmm. think, you know, that this is what the state of California looks like, what mm -hmm. we're doing for our children, not to take away from the individual efforts that our teachers are doing, but just as a society that this is where we've gotten to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I know we do have to remember that it's just one test. You know, there's lots going on in the classroom, but it is, um, you know, we do have to give it some validity. It is our state test and that it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do to, to measure how our students are performing. Yeah. Now, do other states give the exact same test or is it just each state has a different version of how they, yeah, most states do have some kind of accountability, some kind of common assessment that they give, but it's not this test. The SBAC is specific to California and California's standards. Mm -hmm. Of course, each state has, they have different standards as well. So, um, this is measuring progress towards our specific state standards. Yeah. Yep. Uh, something else to that, and, and just listening to your comments and, and your questions, this is the end result of X. The, the question for all of us in here, all the teachers that you see here is, what was that X? Because if we don't know what strategies we used that gave us those scores, then we're, it's kind of like a gamble each year, right? We, we, we're not sure what we're going to get next year. So the, the difficult piece for us is trying to identify which strategies did we use that created a positive impact. And, and again, with the number of children that are needing so much more, not just in academics, it just makes everything that they do in the classroom 10 times more complicated than what we saw five years ago. It was already challenging five years ago. Now it has like three or four layers and that third and fourth layer, we don't really know much about. We're not even sure we have the right resources to address that because we're not even sure what we're seeing sometimes. So the, the task for your administrators is to interpret that data. And, and that's where we also come in at the district. How do we best interpret? Because really it's all about interpretation. And those of you that have worked with numbers, we can make numbers look any way we want. It's really about what does it mean and how do we continue to do that difficult work? We know we can't do it alone. So the more we collaborate, the, the more we can really think about, okay, if this child's struggling in reading, what does that mean? Because that's such a general statement, right? Is it phonics? Is it reading fluency? Is it inference? Is it strategies? Is it lack of reading flu? What is it? And sometimes it takes us a little while to identify. And if we can't identify properly, then how can we target it appropriately? So as you look at these scores, although not obviously not where we want them to be, do know that it's it's taking them a lot just to give us what, what you're seeing here. Well, and some things aren't even within their control, right? Correct. It's, it's things that are, you could, you could beat yourself over the head and still not make move the needle. So it's like, where Correct. can we move that needle? But just as an overall society, that's, you yes. know, but that's so, so right now, I think uh, the best I way I can say it is if, if we're going to fall as um, adults, we're asking let, let's fall forward, <laughs> right? Let's just keep moving forward. But please keep in mind that the job has become so challenging and, and complex, again, with layers that we know nothing about. And we're trying to figure it out on a daily basis. 
And I also want to say that I, I know our teachers have been, um, a lot of teachers voluntarily attending a lot of trainings the last couple of years. Um, I know we are offering compensation, but it's still, it's, it's off contract time. Um, we have lots of teachers that attended a week long training this summer for building thinking classrooms. We've been offering in the area of math, um, math labs after school. And, you know, that's, that's after you've worked all day and you still have planning and grading and things like that. And there's a, a large percentage of our teachers that are wanting to learn new strategies and continue to, to see, you know, what else we can do in the area of math. And so we're seeing that the, as a, as a group, we're really trying. to the chronic absenteeism. Right, thank you. I think that um, you know this report is coming timely and in conjunction with the the assessments that were shared because I think Cleo, Claudia, you've mentioned this several times. It doesn't matter if we have the best teachers, the best strategies, but if our students are not in the seats, then they're not accessing what we have to offer. Um, but, um, you know, this is something that not only are we grappling with, all districts are grappling with chronic absenteeism statewide, nationwide, but, um, you know, there's definitely some positive trends, but, you know, we do have some work to do. Um, so this year we did um, launch our campaign. It's Attend Today, Achieve Tomorrow, kind of giving us a focus of what we want um, want to move our students towards. I thought it would help if um, I provided a definition of what chronic absenteeism is. You know, we hear a lot about it, but what does it actually mean? Essentially, it is looking at students that are absent for 10% of the days that they're enrolled. So this is, it's a, a rolling number, meaning that you could be considered chronically absent in September, October, November, and December. So depending on the number of days that we've been in school, are you absent 10% of those days? And so those, that, that, those numbers, we monitor uh, frequently, at least monthly, so that we can identify students that are going to be at risk for being chronically absent by the end of the school year. But that's kind of how it's calculated to be uh, noted on the dashboard indicator, they take the number of students who are chronically absent for that year, then they divide it by the number of students that um, meet the enrollment requirement, and that will give you the uh, chronic absenteeism rate that is uh, published on the dashboard, okay? So for this year, um, our chronic absenteeism rate dropped pretty significantly to 28.5%. And so what I did was um, show our rates this year in comparison to what we were last year, and then to the two years subsequently before the, the pandemic years. And so while we have definitely uh, increased in our attendance and, or decreased in our absenteeism rate, I mean, you can see the vast difference between how we were, um, the percent that we were rated at back in uh, 2017, 2018, and even 18 and 19. And we were sitting in, you know, kind of close to the 10% across the district with some sites a little bit higher, but, Overall, um, we were sitting close to the 10% area. I did also want to call out the students with disabilities specifically, because this was a subgroup that we were found to be in differentiated assistance with Sacramento County Office of Education, um, because our rate last year was at a 53.9%. But even with that population, we have dropped to 35%. And that is really the testament to your site administrators, your site teams, because this data isn't even anything related to what we did this year. That's what they did last year, making those phone calls, reaching out, putting incentives into place. 
Um, so definitely, you know, we saw improvements across the board at every school site and then district wide. Okay. And when we look at barriers to attendance, we really are focusing on kind of these uh, four and then five if for the kindergarten students. But, you know, what are the barriers for families? Is it social, emotional? Is it behavioral? Is it health? And is it transportation? And going into these conversations with the mindset that these are barriers that we want to help families versus being punitive, we're here to punish you, has really um, I, kind of been at the forefront of our messaging this year and definitely last year as well. And so I wanted to just kind of highlight what this attendance campaign entails. So the first thing that we did was we implemented attendance teams at every school site, and they were already doing this last year, but this is a little bit more strategic. Um, we have a, an administrator, a social worker, a counselor, and then their um, office staff looking at the data, if not biweekly, definitely monthly. And then we meet as a district attendance uh, committee once a month to celebrate the, you know, the, the glows, so to speak, and then address any challenges that we may be having. And also putting together some district-wide consistencies on how we're addressing the attendance issues. And this, you know, it, as basic as, we, uh, when are we calling parents? Who's calling parents? Who is um, running the data? So really having some consistencies around the responsibilities of every uh, site member and then making sure that all the sites are doing this the same way. Um, we, at the beginning of the school year, spoke to administration around kids are going to want to come to school if they have positive learning environments, right? And so what does that entail? It's the engagement. It's the relationships. There's... Um, they want to come to school when it is meaningful to them, giving the staff the tools and the lens to look at, our, do we have these things in place for our, for our uh, students? Would I want to come to school here? Would I want to be in this class? Looks at lots of positive in, uh, incentives and um, interventions that can be put into place to develop those relationships that students want to be here. Um, making sure that if we do have students that are at risk for chronic absenteeism, this is being addressed through the multi-tiered systems of support. This is our intervention process. Um, at the beginning of the year, we had our social workers um, make phone calls to families that were already on our radar from last year. We've also put into place home visits for our social workers and administrators going out to families that, um, for whatever reason, haven't we haven't heard from them. So they're um, each of the sites are doing that uh, consistently monthly. Um, at the beginning of this school year, we provided our school administrators all of them with the same messaging that was then delivered through back to school night presentation. So everybody had the same message. Um, and, um, in, and also focusing on those early years, preschool, TK, kindergarten. Many times we have families that um, don't think it's important, right? And so really um, trying to address and um, the message that these are kind of habits that form early. And so, um, and the research does show, you know, the, the patterns and the performances in preschool, kindergarten carry on through the later grade levels. Um, working with our students on an IEP, being more strategic. If there are students that are generating absences, calling an IEP, addressing those barriers, how can we layer in supports to make sure that the families can get their children to school? And then um, lastly, uh, McCaffrey this year hired a parent liaison specifically for this position. And so they do a lot of the parent reach, outreach and in, in connecting with families to um, address the attendance issues. Yeah. 
And I think that was, and these are just our little door hangers that we created, that we, we went to a training with Sam Joaquin and um, one of the takeaways was these little door handle, door hangers sort of, that when we are doing a home visit and we're not able to connect with the family, we leave them there. We, we, it's a very positive message. Um, we missed you, please contact this, um, whichever administrator. Um, and we've had families that have said, well, you, you've left this, you left the door hanger, so I'm returning your phone call, so. I have a question going back to um, barriers to attendance. So I noticed that number one was socio social emotional. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that. Like what are students and parents reporting to you? I, mean, I know that anxiety is, mm -hmm. is very high right now, especially at the junior high level. So I'm just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, exactly. So it is the anxiety piece that is, um, Students are not wanting to, um, whether it's peer relations or just the um, social media, that has been a big issue. Um, uh, the uh, conflicts that can arise at school that then creates anxious situations for students. Um, there are situations that families are going through, um, whether it's... Um, housing instability, or there's uh, job losses that parents and their uh, children kind of internalize that. And so that creates these barriers for these kids to come to school or want to come to school because they don't, they are afraid to leave their family mm. or their parents at home. Um, and this is where, you know, working with our social workers to really set up those systems for support at school has uh, been very pivotal and critical. Yeah, I did see that when I visited McCaffrey, um, I think it was last month. I was impressed by just the balance of the messaging that like you do need to be in school, but also we're here to support. Mm -hmm. And they, I know that McCaffrey is implementing, you know, strategies to help support students emotionally because it is a big transition from you know, from grade school into middle school. And I think there are more and more kids that are struggling with that. And especially now that social media is causing so much anxiety, you know, kids are coming from, you know, lockdown who are, these are, you know, these kids were in lockdown in, in fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And now they're, they're in thrown into this situation of, of overstimulation almost from a social perspective. And I was lucky enough to happen to be at Greer when they were doing um, some of their attendance celebrations. Mm -hmm. And so that was really fun because the kids were super excited to, you know, get their prize. So it was fun to watch. Yeah. But I do think the communication piece that you have here, I just want to say well done because the more that the district communicates the importance of it. I mean, if it's important to us, it's going to start, the messaging is going to seep through. I'm in a kind of a unique position where I am seeing how other districts are handling. There are districts whose attendance is like dropping off, not quite to like pandemic levels, but it's not improving. And I, I just want to say, I think it's great that we're making an aggressive effort mm -hmm. to, to nip it in the bud. And again, I think, you know, um, the site teams are the ones kind of in the trenches mm -hmm. and they really are, you know, taking the, the extra needed steps to reach these families. Well done. Uh, one quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we trending after the first trimester? Just, I know you don't have the data. Yes. Um, so we actually do pull the data monthly and we were trending in the low 20s. Yeah. So it does fluctuate, but um, yeah, for the first couple of months, we were in the low tw uh, 20s. Thank you. Thank you for that report. Thanks for the effort. Get that attendance back up. We appreciate it. Uh, moving on. LCAP goal number two, transportation services. Hi, good evening. Is this on? Yeah. Um, good evening, board members. Um, so every year we provide a transportation update around this time. 
Um, so we we service both Galt Joint Union High School and the elementary district in our transportation department. And one of the things that we ensure is to provide safe and on-time transportation for all our students. The, our primary objective is to provide reliable um, transportation services. Our team consists of bus drivers, mechanics, trainers, and office to collaborate together to have high high standards for our, to maintain our transportation department. So our office office staff in the bus yarn consists of our transportation clerk, dispatch and our AM early morning, and a, a dispatch instructor also a dispatch PM. So we need someone there in the afternoon when um, um, drivers are coming back, and then our supervisor Michelle. Uh, the bus drivers we have currently, we have seven elementary and then seven high school um, bus drivers. Right now we have a, one substitute and we have bus monitors both in the elementary and the high school. And then for our mechanics, we have one of each, one for elementary and one for the high school. Currently, we are having a driving uh, driver staffing shortage. We we would hope to have more subs. Um, we do have the bus driver training position available on Ed Join, and then sub drivers are needed both for both the high school and elementary. I did receive feedback from our supervisor, letting us know next month we're going to have a a driver trainee um, start getting the hours in for training on the bus. So uh, we're 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 open to help. Uh, um, to train them to become our sub bus drivers just to get the, get it going because we it is it, a shortage that we're all feeling right now in other districts as well. So our students and routes. So elementary has seven routes. This looks similar to the high school, five general education um, routes for each one and two special needs routes. And combined, we have total 14 routes with both the high school and the elementary district. Here's a history, about six year history of the trend, trend in our annual mileage for our buses. Um, their, our elementary is on that, well, it's gonna be my left and your right. So um, you can you notice that in the last year, our, our annual last fiscal year is for the elementary level is about 92,000 um, miles. For the high schools, 132,000. They do have a lot of field trips, they have, um, a lot of sports. Um, so you could see there's a, there is a difference. I know there was a trend from 16, 17. It looks like we were a little high during that year, but then we started stabilizing down us throughout the years. Uh, we were lower during the COVID time period, as you can see the trends going down, but um, it's it, it seems that the high school has more mileage on their buses compared to the elementary buses. Some transportation facts. So each year the department um, oversees about 330 students for each school, about the same. So close to like 650, 70 students that we service. Um, I we, um, Michelle broke this down by general ed population um, with special ed. Um, some great history. You could see the Galt High School bus from 1930. So big difference compared to what our new electric bus looks like now. <laughs> So some great news that I would like to bring up the board, the Triversa student transportation software that we've implemented, um, they, they've been live, um, it's been used right now. I know um, Michelle's been working hard to get that going and um, having GPS, GPS on all our buses to be able to look, um, find, find their location for safety um, in case we need to find out where the bus is or student is. It's something that we could keep track. Of. It's very easy to read um, and communicate um, and, it's um it's going very well and she's liking it. Bus drivers are liking that. Uh, the st the student bus passes. I know we're trying to upgrade the st the current cards that we're using to be able to work together with the the iPad in the car. I mean the tr in the bus. I'm sorry. And um, we just finalized the PO for that to get the right upgraded system. So that way, when a kid comes into the bus, it will it will scan the card and it will let them know if they're in the right route or not. This will be able to identify a student if they're lost and they're trying to find out where are they at. It will let them know immediately to the driver, hey, this student's in the wrong route. We know, notify dispatch in case a parent's looking for them. So it's an easy way to communicate with dispatch, the parent, the school immediately. It's a great tool. Um, so we're just waiting for the upgraded software to be implemented and hopefully we'll have that in the next month or so. So our electric bus project, um, as many of you guys have seen our, our 
our nice electric bus that we have. It is servicing currently um, our pre-K and TK route. Um, it weighs uh, the uh, it features integrated seats that offer security and built-in ch children restraint systems, and the five-point harness designated for children uh, weighing between the twenty two and eighty five pounds. We are waiting for SMUD. Um, we just got approval for them to do the inspection for the transformer for next month. Uh, it, it takes a while. Even once we receive the part, we had to wait for SMUD to allow, then come do the inspection. And then I had to get an inspector to come and give us permission to do the inspection for the installation of the transformer for the charger. So it's a, it's a process to get that installed. We have the temporary one right now. And once we get the actual um, charger for this new bus, then we'll get the refund for the charger portion. And, and, and until the project's completely done, we won't get the refund for that grant. So it's, it's a work in progress. So our transportation department has um, to meet a 10 hours of in-service instructional every 12 months. This gets inspected by CHB and we, we, have, a, we have to document it and, um, to be in compliance. This requirement is, placed, is in place to maintain and refine their skills, to equip, the, equip them with the current knowledge concerning law, safety, and protocols. Um, and this ensures that they can carry out their roles effectively. So every month, they, every Tuesday, second Tuesday of every month, they have that in-service meeting in their break room. So make to ensure that we are in compliance. They also have weekly staff meetings to have a collaborative meetings for any issues or concerns that do come up. So school bus reduce visibility. I know it's getting to that time of year that we do, we, we have um, that winter weather, we have fog. Um, the California mandates the governing board of any district that provides student transportation to adopt procedures um, that limit bus operations when conditions reduce visibility. So our school bus trans trans um, operation shall be limited in those conditions. And um, we have a way to notify our parents um, Right now, we recently implemented our Blackboard to work with our Triversa, our, our Triversa system to be able to text them or email them. If that were that were the case, we'll be able to notify the parent. Unfortunately, we would have to cancel the route, route due to safety concerns, and we'll let them know once um, once we're up and running again. So this is just a, a a rule that the state of California mandates for the safety of the student, the driver, and um, the area. So recently, our bus transportation had a fire extinguisher training. We were fortunate that we had Consumes Fire Department to provide this training for all our bus drivers. The training was coordinated as part of the ongoing efforts to enhance preparedness for our transportation team for emergencies, both on and around school buses. So they practice regular basis to ensure the excellence in our operations. We focus on strategies we know to work, especially when it comes to quickly evacuating children from school buses. And this training, it was we had great feedback from the team, and it, it was something that helped them figure out how to use it. They were very happy to they have the opportunity to learn. Any questions or um, comments? Thank you. You moving on? Other reports? City and schools together? Cast. Right. Thank you. We had our cast meeting um, just this last Monday. Thank you. We had trustees Raboy and Harper for uh, attending our meeting. Um, just a brief summary of what I'll share with the high school, um, their updates, and I'll share the city updates just briefly. Um, the high school, they're um, in the process of reviewing their graduation requirements. They, um, Galt and Liberty High, they have more requirements for credits than I guess other high schools. They have a requirement of 280 credits um, with 100 elective credits. And I guess, especially in the area of electives, that is a lot higher. They don't need that many and it is becoming a scheduling difficulty. So they are in the process of talking with the board about reducing the credits for graduation. Also, they just um, recently had the Arrive Alive Fentanyl student presentation, similar to what we've had at McCaffrey in the past. They said it was very informative and very well received by the students. They also shared the need for mental health counseling. They said that the referrals have really 
increase this year, especially um, for ninth grade. Majority of the referrals, they broke it out by grade level. I, I believe it was close to 50%, 40, 50%. Was that right? Just for ninth grade. So um, they're, they use, I, I believe it's a program called 180, Counseling 180 that they use. And so they just really talked about the need for that. And so those were some of the highlights from the high school. From the city, we talked about um, the city exploring uh, if it's possible to add a four-way stop at Lake Park and Park Terrace. It was shared that that's a very, can be a very dangerous interse intersection. And so uh, city manager, uh, Lorenzo Hines, is going to look into that. They have to do a feasibility study to see if the city can do that. Um, but they talked about doing that. It's um, if you drive down McCaffrey and Lake Park, where the you know the high school intersection. It's also just a two-way crosswalk, not a four-way crosswalk, and you have kids sometimes going diagonal there. Mm -hmm. So it's almost a pedestrian issue as well as a driving issue. So they'll keep us posted on that. They did receive, the city just received a hiring grant um, for um, police officers. They received 125,000 to be spent over the three years. And this was a, a grant that they applied for specifically to help the city pay their portion of a third SRO. And so that is in the works. We should know by December or January when that will happen, but we, both um, both elementary and high school district, we have our portion in our budget for this year. We've talked about that. And so it looks like this is going to be a go and we possibly could be sharing an additional SRO with the high school. They The city's looking into additional mobile cameras within the city limits. I think we've, I think we've started to see a few here and there and they want to get some more. On their November 21st meeting, they'll give a cannabis update. It is just an update. There's no actions. So no actions will be taken. It is just to give the council an update. In their December meeting, they are going to be talking about Walker Park upgrades and possible funding options for Walker Park. And they shared the residential permits that have been pulled to date is 163, which is um, up compared to last year, almost double compared to where they were at last year. So um, compared to their whole year. So we're already, they're already at 163 and it's only November. So, and Liberty Ranch, finally, they shared the um, work over there, the progress phase one and two are pretty much complete for grading for 700 lots. There's still no home developer though. It is currently on the market. And what they have decided to do is instead of trying to sell um, lots for 1400 homes, because that's the potential out there, they are calling them villages. They're breaking them up into smaller villages of 50. So right now what they're trying to do is get a home buyer or a home developer to purchase 50 lots to start breaking ground. They're hoping if they can get if they can get a, a purchaser that they would start in the spring, possibly 2024, but ideally or potentially for 1400 homes out there, they're saying that's really a 10 year plan. It's already been 10 years. Yeah, it's been a while since we, we've been talking about Liberty Ranch for a long time. They're at least moving dirt out there now, so maybe that's a good sign. But they did share it is difficult right now with the interest rates to have home, you know, to buy land right now because they just do not, they're worried about purchasing it and are they going to have buyers? So it might sit for a little while. We'll see. But those were the updates from our cast meeting. Thank you. Anybody have any questions about it? All right. Moving on with school calendars. All right. We have Fairsight Elementary and Early Learning Center. Um, Laura Marquez is with us via Zoom. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Laura. Okay. Well, on Wednesday, December 6th, we will be having a family night. 
Our committee is working out the details, but the focus of the event will be math and will include different math centers um, that parents can do with their children. We're not exactly sure of the time, might be 5.30, might be 5.45, but it is a free event for our Fairsight families. Thank you. Greer Elementary, uh, Mrs. Simonich. Thank you. Lake Canyon, Mrs. Papineau. Uh, in December at Lake Canyon, we're going to be focusing on um, learning about and celebrating the character trait of integrity. And so that will be uh, done through our house meetings and a house rally at the end of the, right before break. Thank you. McCaffrey, Mr. Castillo. So December is always a full month, but one of the things we do want to recognize on December 21st, we're having a minimum day, but we're also doing Renaissance celebration for our students who met the academics as well as their reading goal. Great. And Marengo, Mrs. Papineau. So December is a busy month at all the schools, but um, we're going to highlight that we are having our holiday bingo night on December 15th. And of course, the ever important ugly sweater day on December 20th. And River Oaks, Mrs. Omdis. Okay, so we have December 1st new for our PTA. They have added a family dance. So it'll be a winter dance um, provided by for all families to come. Then the following week, they're opening their holiday store where students will come learning about budgeting, um, how to pay for things and looking at buying for others, you know, not just shopping for what they want. So teaching them those skills, um, it's very popular. It's a week long event. Um, we have tons of volunteers coming every day, um, before school, during school, after school to prep it. And the kids really look forward to it. Thank you. Valley Oaks, Mr. Nelson. All right. Thank you. On, uh, Wednesday, December 13th, we have our annual spelling bee at Valley Oaks. Uh, we usually have some uh, wonderful distinguished judges who are there uh, with us, usually a representative from the board. So we're looking forward to that again. Uh, we had this uh, same student who won three years in a row who has moved on to McCaffrey. So there's some enthusiasm at the school for <laughs> the opportunity for another winner or a different winner this year. Uh, so enthusiasm is up. Yeah, Marengo and Valley, you have your spelling bee on the same day. And Marengo asked me first. So I'm at Marengo this year. I was at Valley, was at Valley last year, but they're on the same day. So sorry, I'm at Valley. <laughs> okay, good. At least we've got okay. I do the same thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I love the spelling bees. All right, those are our calendars. Well, moving on to routine matters, new business. We do have some donations. We do. Greer Elementary Lodi Elks Lodge donated three adaptive tricycles valued at $1,200 for our special day classes. River Oaks Elementary, Denise Mulhern donated 80 Halloween tote bags about valued at $415 for kindergarten and first grade students and Valley Oaks. John Duncan donated office and school supplies valued at $956. Thank you for that. Now, moving on, can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll make the motion for the consent calendar. Give a second. A second. Thanks, Annette. Thank you. I have a motion from Casey Raboy to approve 232435, the consent calendar, seconded by Annette Kunze. Wesley Cagle? Aye. Tracy Skinner? Aye. Catherine Harper? Aye. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Oh. 
to item 232.437. It's a board consideration of resolution number nine, authorizing the filing of documents under the state school facility program and establishing district representatives. Um, so this is because I'm new and then in order for me to sign off um, and provide documents with my signature, they're requesting a resolution um, that the board is approving me as an authorized signer to sign off our facility projects. Thank you. Pretty clear cut. Anybody, uh, yep. uh, can I get a motion to approve? I'll make the motion to approve 232.437. After, can I get a second? I'll second. Ms. Casey. Thank you. I have a motion from Catherine Harper to approve item number 232437, seconded by Casey Raboy. Wesley Cagle? Aye. Tracy Skinner? Aye. Annette Kunze? Aye. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, moving on to 232.438, um, board consideration of approval of uh, MOU between the California School Employee Association and it's called chapter 362 and the elementary pertaining to the creation of the speech language pathology assistant position. Yeah, thank you. So the, uh, we're uh, wanting board approval, a uh, recommendation on this new job description. This position is represented by the classified union and will be at the range uh, CC on the salary schedule. The um, the position entails a, an individual having a specific certification. It's the speech and language pathology assistant certification. So this is different than a instructional assistant. So it does require schooling related to speech and language or communication type disorders. Um, in addition to field work and then on the job training and, a, and a, an assessment. So. Um, we you know, ask for your approval for this position. It's a new position for our district. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Seeing none, can I get a motion to approve? Make the motion. We'll make the motion to approve. Thanks, Tracy. Can I get a second. All second. Ms. Casey. Thank you. I have a motion from Tracy Skinner to approve item number 232438, seconded by Casey Raboy. Wesley Cagle? Aye. Annette Kunze? Aye. Catherine Harper? Aye. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to 232.439. That's a public notice for the initial public notice slash uh, sunshine proposal from the California School Employees Association. And it's called Elementary Chapter 362 to the Elementary District for the 2023-24. Yes, thank you. This is our public notice from our classified union. The articles that they would like to negotiate for this school year, they would like to negotiate leaves, professional growth program, fringe benefits, and wages. And so um, with, with this approval, we will begin negotiations with them um, here in the very near future. Anybody have any questions, concerns? Okay, can I? Uh, well, that's just a public notice. So then, but it's just a public notice. Doesn't say. Right. There's no motion. It is. Sorry, on our agenda we have marked action item, but it is just a public notice. Okay. And moving on, two three two point four four zero. Board consideration to establish December 20th, 2023 at 7 p.m. at the Galt City uh, Chamber as uh, the Elementary School District Board of Education's annual organizational meeting and regular monthly meeting per education code 35143. Mm -hmm. So this would be if um, board approves our annual organizational meeting. What's nice this year, the 15 day period is December 1st to the 20th. And so we made it just by the day we can have our meeting on the our regular meeting Wednesday, third Wednesday is the 20th. So we make it we don't have to change our date. Yeah. Still, still need a motion get a motion to make that our meeting day. I'll make the motion. Okay, Tracy, can I get a second? I'll second. Catherine, correct? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Thank you. I have a motion from Tracy Skinner to approve item number 232440, seconded by Katherine Harper. Wesley Hagel? Aye. Casey Raboy? Aye. Annette Kunze? Aye. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to, I believe this is the last item. Yeah. Uh, 232.441 is the first reading of the following board policies and administrative regulations. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot. There's 23. <laughs> so I'm going to start by saying that, of course, this is our first reading. It's an opportunity for discussion and for questions, comments. And there might be some questions that we can't answer and that we will get back to you if that's the case, because most of these policies, not all of them, but the majority of them are due to new laws that have just recently passed. And so um, if we need to do a little more research, we will and bring that to you at our next meeting before it's an actual action item. And the, since there's so many, they're not grouped by um, cabinet member. So we're just, we know which ones are ours. We're just gonna kind of go down the list um, and give you a brief um, summary. Yeah, I appreciate the little summaries that you included in here. Mm -hmm. yeah, really yeah, Kauai does a great job getting these board policies ready for you. It's a lot of work. So the first one is mine. Um, non-discrimination and district programs and activities. And this is one that primarily most of these changes are due to AB 1078 that recently became law. Some of the highlights with this is that um, it's really um, making sure that the board is, or the board is not pulling certain textbooks, instructional material, um, the use of any textbook instructional material, supplemental instructional material, or curriculum in a school library shall not be rejected or prohibited by the board or district on the basis that it includes a study of the role of the contributions of any individual or group consistent with the requirements under the Ed Code 51204.5. And you're going to see this language, very similar language in multiple policies because this law did make a lot of changes. And so it also does state that um, district programs and activities shall be free of any racially derogatory or discriminatory school or athletic team names, mascots, or nicknames. And it also, I believe this one also allows, I think it's in this one too, allows that any complaints, oh, that might be in the next one, but what AB 1078 does also is it allows any complaints related to this to go straight to the superintendent of instruction. It, they can bypass the board, bypass, bypass the superintendent now for complaints related to AB 1078. So I have a question about that. So if the complaint goes, I'm hearing the county office, is that what I'm hearing? It could go to the county. Well, the, what they want it to do is not really go to the county office. They want it to go to the state oh, superintendent state. of instruction. So then what would be the next thing that would happen if there was a complaint and it went all the way up there? They would do an investigation. Yeah, they would do an investigation. A complaint can still come to the board, can still come to the superintendent, and it can go through our normal uniform complaint process, but it's specifically written now in these policies or with this law that it's, I don't want to say encouraged, but it's almost like if you feel like you're not getting anywhere with the with the district, it's now you go straight to the state state, state superintendent. And they will investigate whether or not the district is following the law. That is that one. And I believe the next one is mine as well. Um, political processes. This here, um, the big change with this one is if there is a measure, a ballot measure, and there's support or opposition that normally has been in the ballot book. Now what's going to happen is the support or opposition with the name is going to actually be in the ballot or on the ballot. And so a lot of times, you know, I don't know how, sometimes I think there's people that they don't read the ballot book. They just go right, right to the ballot 
But now this information is going to who uh, supporters and opposition will be listed on the actual ballot. So I think they're trying to hope to inform voters more on who's opposing or who's supporting um, a measure. And then it also highlights or it outlines the process for a board to go through if they want to show support or opposition of a, a ballot on the uh, measure, measure on the ballot. And then I think next one is for Cleo. Yes, thank you. So the next one is complaints concerning instructional materials. The policy deals with the process we follow when we are adopting new um, curricular materials, the process for complaints. You've heard of that before. Um, complaints concerning the content or the use of the material. And it also states that in reviewing these materials, the materials in question, the process shall not prohibit the use of these materials on the basis that it contains diverse perspectives. Um, when there is a complaint, if not resolved, then the complaint can come to the board and then it goes to the uh, California Board of Education. Along with that policy, we have a regulation and the reg regulation basically describes the five steps that need to be followed when there is a complaint concerning instructional materials and you have those steps in your packet. Okay. Number four is the uniform complaint procedures. The biggest change here, and this also is uh, related to um, AB 1078, is paragraph 10, or no, I'm sorry, number 10, the second paragraph has been added. If you look at number, it's a new paragraph, discrimination includes, but is not limited to, limited to the board's refusal to approve the use or pre prohibit the use of any textbook, instructional material, et cetera. And this one here at the end of this paragraph does say a complaint alleging such unlawful discrimination may, in addition to or in lieu of being filed with the district, be directly filed with the superintendent of public instruction. So this is related to um, the complaint process and if you want to make a complaint, that's a, a new step. The rest is pretty much the same. And then also number five, this again is about a complaint process related to the same bill. This is the Williams Uniform Complaint Procedure. And if you look under filing a complaint, what has been added is the second and third paragraph, very similar language. If a complaint, Williams Act is all about sufficient textbooks. And so if the complaint, if you feel that the board or you feel that there's not sufficient textbooks, as a result or act of the board. So if you feel the board's failure to remedy the deficiency, you may file with the superintendent of public instruction. Um, and also it says if the superintendent or designee becomes aware that a complaint alleging insufficient textbooks or instructional materials has been filed directly with the SPI, but not with the district, the superintendent or designee may initiate an investigation. So if we were to find out a complaint was made, uh, we could we could on our own before we could issue an investigation. So this is about textbooks. And then number six is Ellie. Yeah. So um, I have board policy 1330 use of facilities. Um, what the update had regarding this is other options of how to charge religious groups. Um, we stuck with, uh, we chose to stick with this, the current option. We just charged everyone the same at a rate to make it equitable for the, um, the services. 
um that was the change on that one so we just kept it gave us three options we kept we kept that option one on that one and then the next one with the use of facilities um it also described that we we already do um allowing the public to use our facilities it's a practice we're already doing but now they put it into a board policy another add-on to to that was that we're they're able to use which we don't have a like bicycle scooters electric have access to that. It's not something we have, but it's just a board policy that was updated altogether. Next one, bids. So number seven is related to bids. There's, um, this is a regulation. And so they just have changed, not really changed. These are, this is law. So all of this, the procedures for bidding is what we've followed for a long time. Something that they added that's new, although we follow this because we do a lot of lease lease back contracts. Now, if you have a lease lease back contract, um, a build and all, or alternative design build projects, you have to notify the public or the any bidders that they have to have a skilled and trained workforce requirement, which means that they have to have certain registrations with apprenticeship programs and things like that. And so this used to not be in the policy. So that's something they've added. Um, but the rest of this is really, we've been following it for a long time, the bidding process. And contracts. So our next one is board policy 3312 contracts. Um, so our, the policy is being updated to reflect the new, the new law regarding conflict of interest from campaign contributions related to bribery and public officials. Um, it's a, our basically saying that, that the journal statement requiring the board and the district employees who are involved in the making of the contracts on behalf of the district comply with the district's conflict of interest policy. So we all know we are, we do comply with it. It's just now they're adding the verbiage into our board policy. The next one is number nine, board policy 3460, financial reports and accountability. Um, this one, the difference of what this is now to before is if an, any time we were to borrow um, or request emergency apportionment, basically if we need money now, we are not able to meet our financial obligations for the month. We usually take it to the board, let them know, and it gets approved. Now it's adding, um, allowing the community an opportunity to, to test for testimony, public comment, questions. It's just giving the opportunity for the public to ask questions and why and versus just approving it through the board. Okay. All right. And transportation, the only thing we wanted, we actually wanted to bring this, there were no CSB, CBS, CSBA updates. What we wanted to change was the, the one mile radius for grades elementary for full day kinder to sixth grade. Our current policy reads one mile radius, and it is confusing to parents. We get a lot of calls on what's the difference between one mile and one mile radius, and there is a difference. And so we are just changing this, recommending to change it just one mile. Um, it wouldn't change anything with our transportation, but we think it would clarify for parents. Um, and there is a typo for seven, eight. We're not changing that to one mile. We are keeping that to two miles. We're currently two miles for seven, eight, and we're gonna keep that. So the only thing we're changing is dropping the word radius. The next one is board policy 3551, food service operation cafeteria. Um, for this one, it gave us several options of how we'd like to bring in our, our bids and our for our contracts for um, food services. A common practice that we already do is um, bring it in anytime we'd go into contract and bring it to the board for approval. They had um, other options of how to do this. We decided to keep the same function. Um, it's been working. There's no reason to change it. Um, but now it wants us to choose. It had the option to choose other two options on that. But the, the practice is working. We bring it to the board already. And you guys review and approved it. The other one related to that one, which is the, um, the food services 3551 and add-on. Um, this is an, a board policy in case we do um, donate our foods or dispose of some of the edible foods available to an organization. It has procedures of how to treat, keep track of that. We don't do it now, but the CSB updated that policy in case you ever do do it in the future. 
this is the ABC steps that you have to follow. So for employee compensation number 12, um, board policy 4151, 4251, and 4351, and it gave the an update to for a classify employees that may like 10% of their employees monthly summer salaries to be withheld for the summer um, recess for the um, employee summary assistant program. And, and it also added a repayment procedures uh, when the district has uh, how to process overpayment to an employee. Um, we've been following ed code already. It's just now getting implemented into our board policy. So for layoff and rehired administrative regulation 4217.3, uh, this is a practice, it's already, I and I reviewed it in our, in our current practices. It's basically the, it's defining the length of service for the purposes when we lay off and to determine based on seniorities and the hours and paid status. Good thing we were already doing that. Now it's in our actual board policy. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Getting a bit challenging to keep track of. Okay, I know, know like, of course. <laughs> Okay, uh, board policy on academic honesty. This is just an updated policy that now includes guidelines on the use of technology and artificial intelligence as it relates to improving learning and academic honesty. Um, I think this is probably an item that we will bring back to you at a later time because artificial intelligence is here and we don't know what it means to the work that we do. So <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm guessing, just the first steps in trying to move policy when that really hits the schools. This one is me here, sorry. Let's go back to number 15. We are all over the place here. Yes, this is the same. <laughs> I, I won't read it all again, but it's basically if you feel um, non-discrimination or harassment for any of the reasons that we've already talked about in, in 1078, the process is the same and the language is very similar. Okay, so I have the next few ones. Uh, courses of study. Board policy right now is just updated policy that now includes articulation of courses across grade levels, which is something that we have been doing for a while, as well as articulation with the high school district. Again, something that we have been doing for a while to ensure that students are prepared for high school graduation and for career entry. Along with that policy, we have the regulation, again, updated language to that better reflects the areas of study in grades first through six and then seven, eight, and it better reflects the contributions of all people. The next one is related to homework and makeup work. We don't have any regulation with this uh, policy, so board policy 6154, again, updated language to now include the use of technology to assist with homework. Uh, it talks about receiving credit for late work to encourage continued learning. It mentions after school programs to help students with homework. And now it includes um, language that um, providing that homework needs to be provided to students who are suspended when a parent requests um, such work. The next one is related to homework and makeup work. And this really should not have been included here. So it's it's uh, it's something that we need to rescind. And Kawhi, is there anything else needed for number 18? Thank you. Number 19, this is related to the selection and evaluation of instructional materials. We have both board policy and regulation. The board policy now reflects updated language as well as language stating that the board nor the district can reject or prohibit the use of uh, curricular materials on the basis that it includes a study of the role or contributions of an individual or a certain group. Again, this is something that Lois um, started with. The regulation speaks to the process for selecting and adopting of new materials, ensuring that materials are aligned to the state or common core standards, ensuring that materials 
um, have teacher feedback and that that feedback is presented to you, the board, before materials are adopted. As you know, we are in the process of um, our first adoption for math. That process has started and um, hopefully at a later time we can give you an update of where we are with that. But this policy basically states that teachers need to be involved and that we need to bring that feedback to you before we move forward with an adoption. The next one talks about supplementary instructional materials. There is no um, administrative regulation. The policy does state, or this uh, policy I should say, better describes what supplementary materials should include and it better describes the purpose for such materials. So for example, um, supplementary materials can be used to complete the coverage of a subject matter. If we find that what we currently have doesn't meet the needs of children, then we could augment that program with supplementary materials. And um, we can also select those materials to meet the various learning needs of students. Moving on to 21, this one talks about student assessment. Again, no regulation, but the policy does uh, state that um, there should be guidance mostly on how assessment data should be used, um, the purpose for administering assessments and informing the community and the families of the test results, which is something that we have been doing for a while, but now we have language that speaks to how that should be done. The last one, 22. Uh, library media centers, no AR, but the policy uh, does have updated language that now describes the library materials that uh, need that needs to include print and electronic. Our old policy didn't really talk about um, electronic access. The new language states that gifts and donations shall be subject to the same criteria as other materials um, that the district would normally purchase. So we can't just accept something without it going through the formal process of ensuring that it's aligned to standards. Uh, it also states that no charge should be should take place or be in place for the late return of materials. I don't think we've ever charged children for turning in um, a late book to the library, but this one kind of speaks to you. You can't really do that. So that takes us to the last one with 23, and I don't know who has that one. Yes, that's me. So there's a, a lot added to this one um, related to attorneys. The previous policy was very brief. Uh, in order to meet the district's legal needs, the board may appoint legal counsel and, and fix and order paid legal counsel's compensation. You may do that as an employee or as an independent contractor. And of course, we have attorneys as independent contractors. They are not our employees. Uh, on the next section, they've added retaining legal counsel and they've added contacting legal counsel. The district can, but is not required to initiate a request for a proposal to advertise and solicit attorneys. For contacting legal counsel, the board president or superintendent designee at their discretion uh, can confer with legal counsel if it's in the parameters of, of school business Individual board members other than the board president may not seek advice from district legal counsel on matters of district business unless so authorized by the superintendent, the board president, or a majority of the board. That's new language. I think that's all 23. 11 of the 23 have the 1078. Yeah. Yes. Uh, any questions, comments? So I asked if I could comment on um, AB 1078 because this, and these are just my comments. And so I would invite the other board members to share any of their thoughts as well. Um, but uh, I, when I, this bill was first introduced, I brought it, brought it forward to the board because I could kind of see the writing on the wall that this is potentially going to be very impactful. So generally under um, the ed code, generally speaking, uh, local uh, board has broad powers over local decisions that are made. Essentially, I'm not sure the public realized how much this particular bill took away that decision-making authority from the board. So I just wanted to make sure that, you know, if you have an opportunity and interest to go and look and see where those changes were, because it really did 
um, take away a lot of the local authority. And so the concern is in the event that that comes up, the provisions in that law runs up against other protections for children. Like, is that, I, I imagine that will be a matter for the courts to decide in the end. But um, because it in, in California, we have a supermajority, there was really, it went through pretty clean without a lot of questions um, that maybe would be asked in a, in a different type of forum. So um, that was just my, I, I think there's some provisions in there, just in my humble opinion, um, are basically state sanctioned intimidation with regards to some of the chargeback provisions that are contained in that bill and those provisions. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and then I would just suggest that as we implement it, it's a very, very mindful, intentional approach and that we don't assume that there's a broad brush here and that if we need to ask questions or need to challenge that we do that in order to make sure that we're protecting our children and our students in our local district. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, so I thank you very much for the opportunity to do that. Thanks, Annette, for sharing, sharing that. Um, does anybody else have any, any questions, comments? Okay. And none. Are there any public comments? Yeah. No, there are no requests for public comment. Okay. Um, item J, pending agenda items. Anybody would like to? I have one, and I don't know how the rest of the board's going to feel about it, but maybe we could discuss it here in the future about maybe ending the Zoom meetings. Okay, we'll add that to the next agenda because okay. you can. We, we are not required to have Zoom for board meetings any longer, but so that's definitely something that the board can consider. And. Uh, that no other thing. We'll adjourn. Thank you.